My name is Farron. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I am currently a rabbi. Um, I was ordained as a rabbi about six months ago, um, based out of the United States. Um, I grew up in a really rural part of the United States in Vermont in the Northeast corner. Um, and now I'm a rabbi out in San Francisco in California. Um, and I think it's been a really like roundabout journey to arrive in this role um, and this responsibility in the world. Um, um, I'm currently, um, I'm currently in New York City, which is why I'm in this hotel room um, as a part of a gathering with rabbis for ceasefire in this moment. It's like an emergent organization in the United States of rabbis who are uh, demanding a ceasefire for what is going on in, in Palestine and Israel at this moment. And um, wow. so I think that a lot of my journey to the rabbinate did involve a deep involvement in fighting for justice and peace in, in Palestine and Israel for Palestinians and Israelis. And um, I met Sahar myself through um, a school called Starking School for the Ministry, which is a multi-religious um, graduate theological school, which has a counter, an explicitly counter-oppressive kind of pedagogy. Um, and I had like changed my relationship to the school so much over time. I started off as a staff member, then I got envious of the students and became a student um, and also got the opportunity to teach as well there. And um, Sahar and I were supposed to go on a decolonial pilgrimage to Palestine together to try to explore what it would be like to take a pilgrimage that doesn't participate in the colonial process, but rather decolonizes as we travel. And it was wow. scheduled for, March of 2020 um, and therefore got canceled. It was like the very beginning of, of COVID. Um, and I still think about, I still think about kind of what could have been um, and, um, and just was really grateful to get to kind of learn with that community and grow with that community. Um, so I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Wonderful, oh my goodness. I'm so deeply grateful to receive you and, and to uh, fall into story and presencing with everything that's going on and has been going on between each of us and with you individually. And the next prompt I had in mind was, can you give in your perspective an awareness or description of what is happening now in Israel-Palestine or if you have a, um, like a contextual interpretation of, of what's going on that Let's just start with what's happening, folks that are not aware. It's such a big question because, um, you know, some people believe what's happening right now started on October 7th, 2023, which was a day on, on which Hamas, which is a group based out of Gaza, staged an attack in Israel. And some people are like, where did that come from? That was... Um, unprovoked and there and up until that point there was like relative peace between Israelis and Palestinians and that is what instigated this moment and that is the cause and um what's actually the cause is in 1948 Israel was coming into existence um the process by which it did so involved the expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians from their lands and from their home and ever since then there's been just ongoing struggle um, um, for land and and for home and and a system of imbalanced power and imbalanced rights and, and imbalanced access. Um, and then we could kind of date further back, which is you know the Holocaust um, and how um, the the murder of six million Jews in Europe, led to the international community support for the founding of the state of Israel. And so we can keep going back and back and back. Um, but ultimately um, what I see happening is a struggle for land and a struggle for rights and a struggle for sovereignty um, and how it is manifesting at this moment is this kind of either or situation. It's either we can have sovereignty or we can have sovereignty, either we can have rights or we can have rights. And, um, and uh, I don't think, I think most people don't believe that, but, but at least those in power at, at this moment believe that. And, um, 
and it's and it's leading to just a lot of death and so at this moment I the numbers I don't know what the numbers are but above you know above 20,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza by Israel's bombing campaign uh, I think maybe around somewhere between 1500 and 2000 Israelis have been killed most of that was on the very first day um, but it has only been kind of military casualties since then um, and the death toll continues to rise. There's a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. There's no food, there's no water, there's no access to humanitarian aid. It's really dire. Um, and, and, you know, as a US citizen, the US is, is complicit because the US is blocking the UN from actually taking action to, to stop what is happening. Um, and so as a US citizen and as a rabbi, I feel it's like my responsibility to, um, intervene in this moment so that there's so much more I could say but that's a little bit of what's going on at this time and it only paints like a you know a fraction of the story I would say but I feel that like people try to paint this as like an Israeli versus Palestinian struggle or even like worse a Jewish versus Muslim struggle which like is so inaccurate it's like wild how inaccurate that is um mm -hmm. but it's really a struggle of like power over versus like just humanity right it's like the struggle exactly. between people who want to hold power over other people and at the expense of other people versus people who want to like live in harmony and peace with other people and I I recognize the role trauma plays in that um but that doesn't justify it and so I recognize that for example, like from my perspective, the way anti-Semitism operates, um, it has led Jews to believe that they're not safe anywhere unless they are the ones with power over. Because anywhere they've been where someone has had power over them, there's the narr as the narrative goes, they've eventually, you know, been harmed in some way, in varying ways, leading all the way up to and including genocide. And so there's this narrative of like, we won't be safe unless we are the strong ones. And like, what does it mean to have power over in our culture? It's to dominate violently. And I, you know, for me, I'm like, if that is what Jewish safety requires, then I'd rather not be safe. But I do not believe that that is what Jewish safety requires. Um, and I don't think that what is happening currently does anything to keep Jews safe. Like, right, we're like seeing that, like Jews are not being made any more safe by, you know, an oppressive, re oppressive regime that's like not only like killing Palestinians en masse right now, but it's oppressing any of its own people who happen to attempt to dissent in any way um, to the system. And so, it's just, it's so painful that people paint it as kind of like we're fighting against each other when it's really actually the masses who are trying to join together and advocate for peace and justice and liberation for all peoples. And then certain people who just don't believe that they can exist without exerting power over others. And it's just really, just really devastating. I, I talk a lot in my work about introverted activism. And as a neurodivergent, I do find demonstration spaces are sometimes too much for my nervous system regulation, but I like support in multiple ways. And of course the arts are a means of support. From a young age, I started getting involved in um, kind of like nonviolent direct action for, for justice. And I think it really started out like in Palestine, I was putting my body between Israeli soldiers and like Palestinians homes who were being demolished or Palestinians who were like trying to cross the wall to reach their land, which was on the other side and getting shot out by tear gas and all of these things. And, um, and I feel like that there definitely was this, there is and was this feeling of like needing to be hard, you know, needing to have this hard exterior. And I think that work is so valuable and so important and was incredibly formative for me. Um, and it also just like exposed the mechanisms of, of violence that are so entrenched and so 
so deep and so othering. Um, and then kind of kind of coming back to the United States and taking action either for Palestine or for um, for other you know issues here in the US. Um, it was like a same thing of like you go into an action and you put on your suit of armor and you're tough, you know, like you gotta be tough because the systems that you're trying to break down are tough and you have to out tough them. But I think there's a way that that kind of leans into just recreating the same systems that we're trying to, to tear down. And I think there's a role for that and there's importance in that. And I do think it's made me feel really powerful at times and feeling powerful in the midst of like the machinery of global violence is, is really important. And like, I am not uh, tough. I'm like soft and I'm supple and I'm, I'm, um, what's the word? Like, you know, things break the barrier and, um, and there's gotta be room for, I think there's gotta be room for that as well. And I, so I think something like we've been navigating within, within the Jewish community in terms of our, um, advocacy and our protest for kind of a ceasefire at the at the least is what's the role of Jewish ritual in in the labor, liberation of Palestinians and again like Palestinians are not a monolith and they're not all just Muslim as like the the global narrative wants to say but like there are Jewish Palestinians as well um and um and I think that um, but there is a question when it's like when Jewish language and even Jewish ritual has been used to oppress Palestinians, like what is the role then in of Jewish ritual in the liberation movement? And some are like, it doesn't have a role because it's played an oppressive role. And some are like, it needs to have a role because we need to reclaim it. And so I've been like thinking a lot about the fact that, you know, Israel's been bombing hospitals and mosques and universities and basically every institution of any sort in Gaza. And after taking over one mosque, they got on the loudspeaker where we usually hear the call to prayer um, in Arabic and instead said the Shema, which is like the central Jewish prayer as a way of like being like, this is ours now and use the Shema, which is this call to say like, the divine is one and we are one and we are all one community and and used that in order to like express domination over and I find that so incredibly devastating that prayer could be used in that way so of course I could see why a Palestinian doesn't want to hear that prayer said for their liberation and simultaneously it feels crucial to me as like a Jewish spiritual leader that we don't surrender Jewish practice to like to a violent government that is like trying to co-opt and use it to say that like only Jews should be allowed safety and sovereignty um and so I think for me I'm like I both want to see ritual and Jewish ritual as like a part of as a part of action. And I also, as you all were saying, like see ritual as action in and of itself. And it has power and it has efficacy and we need to be leaning into that in this time. Well, more prompts. One was, how does this affect your heart? Because I think it's building into what we have already kind of rubbed up against and was one of the intuitive prompts that came. And the other I wanna expound, it's what is one thing to guard against in social justice engagement or the avoidance of it. So we're often instructing um, it's for individuals to put away like nihilist thinking that we can never solve this issue or guilt narratives that stop the actual actions and engagements. I think that this really gives people a, a they there's a there's a verb there's an essence of engagement and integration and just presencing and listening to you. But I know that you also probably have great insight and advice that these questions kind of go together because it's speaking to, to that of the fight flight or or freeze is speaking to the freeze response so i know that people who have an interest in being engaged feel frozen heart tending is a lot of what needs to happen or is a is part of the foundation and the grounding with which you're able to unfreeze yourself 
and and to act so that's why i put them together how do we not just like fight against the thing that we find wrong but how do we actually build the just and liberatory alternative so i think we can't just say like stop bombing we can't just say like stop the siege on gaza we can't just say end the occupation like we need to say what comes next and not just like the diplomatic solution one state solution and two state solution which i think is like you know maybe important but to me like that's not the conversation we need to be having we need to be having a conversation of like what does it actually look like and i think like a lot of us have been talking about like i was part of a, 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 a shabbat ritual where we ask people to write like what is your vision for a ceasefire and beyond like once we have a ceasefire like what then right like that is just the very beginning and if we can't imagine the beautiful like world of of kind of like collaboration and love and peace and justice and and rights and like that we kind of need if we can't even begin to imagine it, then there's no way we're going to build ourselves there. And so I think we have to start with the imagined vision, right, of that of that liberated Palestine, which is a Palestine for all peoples, um, and um, and work backwards rather than like starting with a ceasefire and working forwards in a sense. Um, Cause I think that a lot of our work ends up being like anti, anti, anti. And I'm like, what, but what are we for? And can like what we're for drive our action rather than what we're against? So I wanted to end or almost end in what are ways that organizations can be more vocal and supportive on this issue? And what are some active steps that can support individuals in being more like positively engaged on the issue. So we've talked about that a little bit, but also maybe the ways that individuals can engage. So I think for me, especially like I've always been Jewish, um, but as a rabbi, I think it's even it's even more. Um, I'm noticing it, it. It is changing the way I approach uh, what's going on over there in many ways, and. Um, I think one is it like it really makes my priority the Jewish people in a, in a certain way that it wasn't before. It's like that is my role and that is my responsibility is to like serve Jewish people. And so I think that like one thing that Jews can be doing in this time to be positively engaged in this issue is like deep, deep trauma healing, like truly, truly deep, deep trauma healing. Um, and I think what's really fascinating about this is like we we know epigenetics and we know that trauma can get passed genetically from generation to generation and that that many Jews especially Ashkenazi Jews Jews from Eastern and Central Europe kind of have that epigenetic imprint that's like boiling inside of them and and leading to these trauma responses in situations that might not merit them and I also know that like the way in which we teach Judaism and raise our kids Jewishly is like trying to impose that trauma narrative onto people whose ancestors maybe didn't even experience that trauma. They're trying to say like, just like we have this like saying in, in Jewish tradition, like we were all at Sinai, like every single one of us, we were all there at Sinai. We received revelation from God collectively. There's this thing where people are like, we were all in the Holocaust. Um, even like none of my direct line experienced the Holocaust. And yet like there's this, there's this imprint that our, that the way we raise our kids and teach our kids within Jewish community is like, you were there too, you experienced this oppression too, and you must like hold this trauma too. And I think it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. Um, and I, I think that if we as a community are going to really wrestle with the fact that like, yes, Jews deserve rights, and yes, Jews deserve sovereignty, and yes, Jews deserve to live in liberation, but not at the expense of others. And if we're really going to grapple with the fact that the way in which the state of Israel was founded and is being carried out is a liberation, if you can even call it that, at the expense of another people and at the expense, therefore, of our own humanity, then um, we need to do trauma healing, and we need to do trauma healing not only of 
the trauma that's like directly in our line, but the kind of like projected trauma that we were taught at a young age and absorbed into our systems. Um, and we need to grapple as a community with that trauma response so that we can actually recognize and see like the state that so many of us are so attached to as our like Messiah is not that. And it's not acting that way. And like, we can't, we can't cling to a false Messiah that claims to be a liberator when it's actually contributing to our oppression. And we must like demand that, um, that our safety not, not require violence and not require oppression. Um, and so I think that's like really it for me is like just a deep wrestling and a deep reckoning within the Jewish community um, is like, it's the first step because I like, I can see like Jews are not able to, many Jews are not able to get to the point of like really even seeing the truth of what's happening because the trauma is so deep. And so like that is both kind of like my call and also like what I want to support Jews in, in doing at this time. Very deeply moved. I found myself on more than one occasion blinking back tears and I wanted to speak to it. Um, on the one hand, um, honoring emotionality and letting it flow and how important that is to the trauma care component that we spoke to. And also really having a deep, um, uh, like want to kiss your feet, honoring of the strength that you're holding with the proximity that you have to this deep issue and, and wanting to make space and not take space from um, all the beautiful ways that you dance with this sometimes violent and sometimes beautiful world. 